What does a good color picker look like? Is it square? Is it a circle? Is it a triangle? Hi, I'm Roman Jan Storm, and this is Designing a Good Color Picker. A color picker usually looks a little bit like this. We have some color, we have HSB or HSV values, LAB values, RGB, CMYK, hex, and some swatches. And swatches are basically like the saved colors that we can quickly and easily reuse. So those are the features of like a typical color picker probably. But wait, there's more. For example, in this red ketchup color picker, we again have the square of color, but we have way, way, way more swatches to choose from. So we can pick between a lot of setup colors and quickly move between them. And then once we selected one, we can move through the square and pick whatever color we want. But there's also a spectrum where we have all this color from left to right, and then also top to bottom, it's darker and lighter. It's pretty neat. So we can go between all the different colors within this section. And there's also a magnifier. If we really want to go to like the pixel perfect level of what we want, this exact color with these values, and kind of look through it that way. That's, that's kind of neat. It's a neat way of working with a color picker. So let's add that to the list, right? We have a spectrum view and a magnifier. But wait, there's more. For example, here on the Canva website, we have this color wheel that's round. And we also have set to complementary mode where we can select one color, but then we also get the exact opposite color. And then there's this ring around the circle that goes from darker to lighter. We can also choose different modes, like for example, monochromatic. Now we have one color, but also one color that's very close to it. And we can also select analogous where we have one color, but then also the two to the side of it that are again quite close to it. And again, we can see all the hex values for these colors and pick one, but also get ones close to it. There's also triadic where we can pick one color, but there's also the opposites, but in this case, sort of like in a triangular shape, which is pretty neat. And then we also have a tetradic, which is four of those points. So we can select one color, but also get four sort of the opposite colors of this thing, which is, Pretty cool, it's pretty neat. So let's add that to the list of features, right? So we have more features. Okay, great. But wait, there's more. For example, on the Figma website, we have in this case, again, a round color picker and again, a complementary system. We have hex, we have RGB, HSL, HSV. And we have this bar at the bottom that goes from dark to lighter. Okay, neat. So like you know, some similarities, some things are a little bit new, but we also have split, monochromatic. We have analogous, triadic. So we have some interesting features to go through. Okay, so let's 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 add those as well. So right, we have a lot of features now, but wait, there's more. Because what about a triangular one? This is made by Hugo Daniel, it's pretty neat. So we have lighter and darker, top to bottom, and then we have saturation left to right. It's pretty cool, we see the hex value, we also see the shades, which I think is very neat. We also see the tints, and we have some palette at the bottom. And then we can move this circular one around to change the color. It's, it's pretty cool. And so like once you've selected that, you can go back to the triangle and you know choose whatever particular color that you want to use. Neat. But there's also another option. If we go to this thing over here, we also get hue, saturation, and lightness and sort of move it through there. That's that's kind of cool. All right, so let's let's add that to the feature list. So now we have way more features, but they don't really fit on the this list anymore. So let's move the list up and we can squeeze them in here at the bottom. But we also had the original features all the way at the beginning of the box that we saw, like the, the square one, the original color picker we saw. So let's, let's squeeze this all in and, and then add the features to the top. And this is 20 features. This is way too many. And that takes us to takeaway number one, which is always be careful of feature creep. Features are very shiny, but do you really, really, really need them? Think of all the effort it takes to program these features and also all the upkeep these features will require. So it's good to ask who will actually use these features and how much will they use them? We basically have to ask, what is the purpose of the color picker? Like, why is a color picker used? So let's ask, let's ask why, 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 and find out. In this particular case, I'm asking specifically for team projects. Like if you're working as a team and there's a color picker, not a singular artist, but a team of people working on a project who need a color picker. So let's ask why, 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 why? So why is a color picker used? Well, to select a specific color. Why is that? It's to give something that color. And why is that? So that it matches well with other art. And why is that? Well, because art direction is required. Why is that? Because the project needs a cohesive art style. Okay, so why is a color picker used? It's because the project needs a cohesive art style. 
So when you're designing tools and workflows, it's important to look at what the user is trying to get done in the bigger picture. It's the second takeaway. For example, you can do that by asking why, 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 and finding out like what is the user actually trying to achieve here? Are they trying to win art awards, design awards? Are they trying to sell a lot of copies? What is the particular thing that they're trying to do with these tools? Because mistakes are very, very easy to make. For example, if we have a color picker like this, where any user can pick any color at any time, it's very easy to accidentally pick the wrong color. For example, in these six squares, which color is wrong? I'll give you a minute, take a look at it. It's the one in the top right. The top right is slightly off from the other ones. Let's do another one. Which color is wrong out of these six squares? Okay, I'll give you a second. Take a look at it. It's the one in the bottom left. So as you can see, if anyone's allowed to just like pick colors, it's very easy to accidentally pick a slightly off color. Let me give you an example from Team Fortress 2 that is recently also was in the news. So out of these two scouts, their pants, which color is wrong? So it turns out the left one is the fixed texture, that's correct. The one on the right is the current texture, which is technically wrong. It's technically not the right color pants. And actually, Valve actually fixed this 17-year-old bug that made Scout's pants the wrong color. But they also immediately unfixed it. They went back to the wrong pants. Why'd they do that? Well, because in the cinematics, in all the clothing that was made, like all the accessories that people made for Scout, they were all fitting and they all looked like the old color pants. So they had been in the wrong color for so long that they were essentially just stuck with the wrong color. So someone made a mistake you know, very, very early on and this kind of just stuck through. Even players kept mentioning like, hey, these pants are wrong. I kind of just stuck with it. So as you can see, it's very easy to pick a wrong color and just kind of like not spot it. So wrong colors are very easy to use, especially if everyone can select a color. Like if anyone can pick any color at any time, then you've created more cleanup work for everyone else later on, especially for QA. They're gonna have to dig through so many things throughout the world and find out like, hey, is this actually the right color? Is this actually the right color? As we saw earlier with the squares, it's very, very easy to accidentally pick a wrong color that looks very close to the correct color. So that takes us to takeaway number three, which is guardrails can save time, even as a warning to prevent catastrophic input. Sometimes giving the user a lot of freedom is powerful and allows for creativity, but at other times you're facilitating situations that are costly to be cleaned up later. Think about version control in Perforce, for example. You can lock content so nobody else can touch it. That's very useful in some circumstances. So you have to ask, like, do you want every user to select every color manually? Really, the answer is usually like all team members? No. But art directors and artists? Yes. So if you look at like a team of people making a project, right? We have programmers, we have designers, we have artists, and we have directors. So really, all these folks in red don't really need to select like any color at any time. We need the artists and of course the art director to be able to select any color they want, but everyone else doesn't really need to do that. So if we divide that up, then really like 66% should only select swatches and 33% should set up those required swatches. And that means from a feature level that 66% of people do not need a detailed color picker, but 33% do need a detailed color picker. So we can see that it's really like a vast majority that don't need a lot of features. We can make this much simpler if that works with the project. So if we look at all those features from earlier, we don't really need all of those. We just need a couple. In this case, color, hex, and swatches. If we have those, we're a lot of the way there. Because in that case, these artists can set up the required swatches. For example, for the NPC clothes of Village One, or dangerous dialogue choices, or save points, or the romance UI, or dark magic VFX, or maybe the blue team pants. And we can see with all those colors that they're all used for very particular things. The color picker is used for all these kinds of things. For example, for world building, for UI UX, for level design, for character design, for VFX, for narrative. This color picker used in all of these different places is important for all of these various teams. So the color picker needs to facilitate every team having the right color at the right time. 
the color picker is not used on its own. It's always used together with other tools as well, right? Like people are using it in level editing. They're using it in the VFX editor. Like it's used all over the place. And so from a workflow standpoint, really what this looks like is that there's an artist somewhere and they're using a color picker, but they're not just like directly applying that to Scout's pants. That's wrong, right? Again, two colors, slightly off, difficult to spot. Instead, of course, they look at a color picker and they select what color they need, put it in a swatch, and then someone else can use that swatch and then apply that to Scout's pants. And that's the correct way of doing it. And we see some of those guardrails already. For example, in Word, they have this neat system where in this color section over here, we have all these colors and they have text, explain what it's for, like with an accent, okay, what kind of color it is. You can go further down these swatches and find different versions, lighter and darker versions of them. And you also, of course, have some standard colors that you can look through if you really need some standard colors, that's fine too. So you have all these colors to pick from, but they're set up in a way where they generally kind of work well together. And of course, some recent colors if you pick those. But if you want more, that's possible too. Click on more colors and hey, there we have a color picker, right? So you still have the color picker, but it's not there right away when you're trying to select colors. First, you get some swatches of like, hey, make sure to use these ones. And then you can still have hex and RGB after that if you really, really need them, or if you're an artist and just need to do that. Click OK, and then we have a particular color that we need. And then great, we see it in the recent colors that we've used. So you need to shift the mindset from what is a good color picker to what is a color picker used for? And that takes us to takeaway number four, which is find out the connections of the tool to adjacent workflows. Like find out how is this used in other ways? Because tools have to facilitate that kind of change. I say this often that building content is only 20% of the effort. The other 80% is iterating that content. If you could build a game in one go, it'd be a lot faster to build a game in one go, but there's gonna be a lot of iterating in there and that iterating needs to be facilitated by the tools and workflows. For example, let's say we have all these colors, right? And we're happy with these colors, work great, nice. But a director comes in after some user testing or whatever it may be, and they say like, whoa, the Romance UI and Dark Magic are too similar, we have to change this. And so they change the dark magic to be darker. So now the VFX for dark magic should be darker. Okay, great. But now a whole bunch of other people come up and kind of go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we have to do loads of overtime to change that color everywhere. And that's terrible, right? Like we don't want that to be the case. Like if every change means a lot of people have to do crunching or overtime just to change those things, that's bad. We don't want that. So let's make sure each color is saved as a variable and referenced. Because in that case, if we change something, it will update automatically. So where every location of color is used, it updates automatically because it's saved to a swatch. So the artist will be like, hey, this is the dark magic color. You use the dark magic color in various places, and now if the dark magic color updates, it updates to wherever it's also used, just like other assets. Because in that case, you can iterate and iterate and iterate to your heart's content. Like, oh, the romance UI should be a different color. Great, we'll change it. And uh, oh, safe points are hard to find in the world, so let's change those colors. Or at NPC close, the village one, they need to be slightly different now because they're too similar to save points. Great, we'll change that. Or hey, uh, dangerous dialogue choices need to be clear that they're super dangerous. Okay. Or, you know, the blue team pants need to be lighter. Great. Facilitating that kind of iteration is super duper important. And so you have to think about UI, UX, data, and workflow together when designing tools. Because the technology behind the color picker is just as important as the UI of the color picker. And by tying data to the underlying systems, we can see the color workflow has gotten more powerful even if the color tool did not get any new features. It's important to see that difference between workflow and tool. Always note the difference between these concepts. You can change a lot of workflows without touching many of the tools, if you're touching, for example, the data underneath it. And you can change a lot of tools without really improving a lot of workflows. So if we look at that giant feature list, that all sounds really, really neat, right? It all sounds really helpful for people to have. And it's very easy to argue that you need to have all of this because it's that easy to argue. Like all those features, they look neat, other people have them, they sound nice, so why shouldn't we just have them? It's very easy to fall into that trap, so be careful of that. Like a tool must be powerful is a very easy trap to fall into. Like it's such an easy trap to fall into. It doesn't have to be powerful. 
You can make it really neat and nice and still do the things that you need to do when making a project. So don't fall into that. Don't fall into that trap of like, oh, a tool must be powerful. So do you need to build it? Like, do you really, really need to build all these features? Or is there a publicly available variant that you can use? For example, one that's square or a circle or a triangle? That takes us to takeaway number five, which is check if there's a free tool available. Sometimes you don't need to do all that work in making a new tool. You can just check like, hey, is there a free one available? Awesome, let's use that. So when it comes to designing a good color picker, here's the takeaways. One, always be careful of feature creep. Two, look at what the user's trying to get done in the bigger picture. Three, guardrails can save time, even as a warning, to prevent catastrophic input. Four, find out the connections of the tool to adjacent workflows. And five, check if there's a free tool available. And these things can really help you in making better tools. Because sometimes when you're looking at a tool like this, really all you need is this. And this, this is a good color picker. Thank you very much. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more videos about tool design.